Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives, and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian, and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Loyalist will be hearing about a solicitor who fought for a case he couldn't win, and with my guest, we'll be on the hunt for any evidence of their ancestors' First World War service. So, put down that workhouse admissions book, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a family historian who is just as happy digging through records in an archive as he is digging through layers of soil as a professional archaeologist. So, before I have to extend a trench over this ditch of an introduction, let's head over to the finds table to meet my guest, James Danter. Hello, James. Welcome to the Family Histories podcast. Hello, Andrew. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm curious as to finding out which came first, your interest in family history or your interest in archaeology? I'm afraid it's the archaeology. It's um... <laughs> oh, Well, that was a lovely episode today. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's um, I, I'm actually reasonably new to the family history, so um, okay. I, I've only been doing it really for about two years. Okay. So, but the archaeology, I've I've always been interested in. Um, my granddad was a keen sort of am- amateur archaeologist, and my mum was always very interested in it. And I grew up on Time Team, and you know, yes. <laughs> all the usual uh, routes in. So, uh, family history is a lot more recent for me. So, what kind of digs have you worked on within those? those years as an archaeologist? I've been a professional archaeologist for a little over six years now, so I've, I've done quite a lot really. Say so archaeology, or at least what I do within archaeology, is, isn't what you'd really imagine. Okay. I think it's about 95%, or like, I'm, don't quote me on that, of archaeology in the UK is actually done as part of the planning process right. rather than, you know, through a time team sort of thing or university. Yep. It's all sort of tied up with housing developments, quarry extensions, oh, infrastructure see. projects, yep. that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, so we're the, we do the the bulk of, you know, the archaeology that actually comes through, really. And on that, you know, we work on all sorts of stuff, really. So you get large, you know, vast open area excavations. Um, you get evaluation trench record uh, recording. So, um, like, you know, your more classic time team sort of stick a trench in here and dig the ditch and dig the post hole and that sort <laughs> of stuff that looks better on TV. But it's actually yeah. probably one of the harder sort of parts of archaeology of what we do. And then you get lots of smaller stuff, but you also get stuff sort of in the office outside of the field as well. So desk-based assessments, for example, okay. historic buildings recordings. Um, so quite the spectrum, really. I've, I've, I've done a bit of everything, really. Yeah, I was certainly raised on a diet of watching... Tony Robinson leaping around various trenches yeah. on Time Team. Very much enjoyed it and wanted to be an archaeologist as well. <laughs> Never too late. I don't think I've got the knees for it, though. I really <laughs> don't think I can do it. No, that's yeah, they are they are essential, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, it looks like a lot of hard work. And I think I'm massively underestimating that as well. Uh, yeah, no, that's fair. That's, uh, yeah, it's a lot harder than uh, what people think. You know, obviously on Time Team, you get people with little brushes and, um, yeah. you know, the, the smallest sort of trousers you can possibly imagine. Like, well, I've never used a brush in six years. You know, it's um, <laughs> like it's it, it, it's a lot more intense than what you might imagine. Fair enough. What's been your favourite find so far? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that one. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it's not it's not an answer you'd expect, really, because obviously what's interesting to archaeologists isn't necessarily interesting to most other people. So um, I try and I try and meet halfway, but it's also sort of one that interests me as well, which is um, it was about two, three years ago, I was working on a project in Bedfordshire, and in the bottom of this pit I found... Uh, what was half of a Neolithic ground and polished axe head. Oh, okay. Um, which had been made originally up in, I think, Cumbria. Quite a distance. Yeah, that's it. It's, long, it's come a long way. And it was only half of it. And then, interestingly, about a month later, a colleague of mine found the other half in a different feature about 20 metres away. <laughs> wow. So... Um, I mean, it's rare that you can sort of tie two finds together from different features that concretely, if you see what I mean. So 
I mean, that you know, that I think an axe head's a dream for most most archaeologists, really. Um, yeah, that was that's my favourite so far. Wow. So just parking archaeology for a moment there, how did you get started in researching family history? Well, th- this is also a good question because um, I actually don't know, really. <laughs> I just sort of, I, I blinked and all of a sudden I was, you know, I jumped in feet first into the world of genealogy. I think I was, I was, on, a, um, I was on an archaeology project actually in South Yorkshire. And it was it was pretty slow going. There wasn't an awful lot happening. And I was sat okay. there thinking, you know, oh, I, I really wonder what, like, you know, it just occurred to me that I knew nothing about, like, my family history at all. And I thought, how strange, really, that, you know, I spent this many years looking at, you know, uncovering the voices of people who can no longer speak. And I don't know anything at all about the voices of, you know, my great grandparents or their great grandparents or so on. Yeah. And I thought, that's just, I've got to do something about that. And I sort of... I made the mistake that a lot of people did is, you know, I got myself like a free trial on, um, well, there's Ancestry on this, but it could have been, you know, any of the others. And I, I jumped down the same rabbit hole that a lot of people did. And I followed the hints and, you know, within about three hours, I was back in, you know, the seventh century. Yep. Um, and job I, I done. thought, yeah, job done. Brilliant. That was easy. Didn't need two weeks free trial like that'll do. <laughs> and then I sort of, I, I slept on it a little bit and I thought, no, nah, that can't be right. In a job where everything we look at is so evidence-based and we don't say anything without having at least some sort of educated guess behind it, um, at the very least, I thought, you know, why have I suddenly taken everyone else's word for it? And given that a lot of these people in the 7th century are people that i just never heard of, um, which seemed unlikely in that period. Um, and I thought, yeah. OK, well, if I do that at work, going through, looking at the evidence, trying to make interpretations based on that, I should probably try and do it for this. Right. And I realised that, I mean, literally about, literally at my great grandparents, I'd made a mistake instantly. Ah. And I just I thought, OK, well, I need to go through this much more methodically. Um, and since then, I realised that's far more satisfying. It certainly is. I guess that approach is quite like archaeology, because I would imagine that When you're being an archaeologist, you're going through layer by layer by layer in the stratigraphy of the of the ground. Mm, That's it. And in genealogy, it's very tempting to just dive straight in at some point in history and then just research out from there. Oh yeah, that is a quite a quite a trap to uh, just accept all the hints. I'm afraid, but I'm glad that you've uh, I'm glad that you've worked that one out. Yes, me too. It's been much more rewarding having done it the proper way. So, uh... (laughs) so are there any other areas where? archaeology and family history tends to kind of cross over? Oh, absolutely. Within excavation, I mean, ones that my colleagues have done, for example, they were digging in Manchester, I believe it was. And a lot of the archaeology in Manchester is on old rows of old terraced houses, trying to work out, you know, what the living conditions were like, okay. how these things changed, how some of, some of there were laws introduced that sort of, you know, made it illegal for people to be living in a particularly bad way, to simplise it. But, and we looked to see if that can be seen you know, within the structure of the buildings. So one of my colleagues was digging up one of these cellars, um, one of these old cellars, and someone walked past the side of the site and said, oh, I was born in that cellar. <laughs> Very strange, isn't it? You don't think, you, 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 I mean, you get, you get so tunnel vision like with all this that you sort of focus on this feature, this building, that you don't actually think that people live there. Or did anything like you forget that everything you're doing is was important to someone's, someone's home. home yeah exactly it was important to somebody um and then all of a sudden you stop and realize like oh my wow you know this is this is i can't believe it and then we've had uh, there was a story when i was at university of they were doing an excavation a similar sort of thing really excavating like a row of houses that were knocked down in the 70s or so mm-hmm. and yeah they were excavating this step by the back door and then a woman walked past the site and said oh this used to be my house um and then she started crying because she said the step that was being excavated, that was the step that you, she used to sit on and cry at when she was upset when she was a child. And she went back and sat on that step. And apparently everyone was very emotional, as you can understand. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's weird to think that there could be that literal connection, which does sometimes happen. But, I mean, outside of excavation as well, as I say, there's, there's so much like in the world of archaeology that people just outside of archaeology don't really know, which is a shame, really, because then we're trying to change that, but it's very difficult. One sort of type of work we do, and which is one of the most common, and almost all sites that will have gone to excavation will have probably done that this stage of it already which is a desk-based assessment which is where you know you might be given a site which could be an arbitrary specification or it could be a property or it could be a whole street or more and then basically someone sits there and just researches you know it to death basically and then puts it into a report (laughs) an example that i had i was looking into one of my wife's ancestors this ancestor was living in salford i think in about 
I think the 1891 census, he came up in Salford. Okay. And uh, he's living on a place called Albert Street. And I was telling one of my colleagues about this. And then all of a sudden, she turned around and said, oh, we did a reasonable amount of work in Salford. And she said, oh, I did a DBA on Albert Street. And then she sent me the DBA. And yeah, she had literally, a couple of years before, had sat and researched this row of houses. Um, unfortunately, it was the other side of the road to the ones that they lived in. But, you know, it doesn't, it, it's, it's close enough. Oh. Yeah, and obviously they'll, they'll be researching within a wider area as well to see what's going on in the area and stuff. So you've got, I've got this report, which is, you know, it's, they vary in size, really. But, you know, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty extensive. Um, and it's got photos. It's got uh, descriptions of the houses. It talks about the living conditions, what the people would have been like, you know, what their like sort of level of living would have been. Yeah. This was again, this is Salford, Manchester. They they insist on census records as well. So you've got transcribed census records as well in the report. You know, it's amazing. And then subsequent to that, it went on to do excavations. So they dug up the. Um, I don't know if they actually found anything. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you do. And it's just not something you'd think to look for you don't think family history oh, i'll check the archaeology and see what's there <laughs> do you think that the relationship between maybe family historians and archaeologists or maybe the other way around has improved over the last few years because family history is obviously coming from a what well, has traditionally come from a kind of a it's your hobby but there are now qualifications mm. that you can have in that and obviously archaeology has a very established uh, academic route to it so do you think that relationship has got better that's a good question i think to be honest with you, I think, I think we're still at the stage where one is reasonably unaware of the potential of the other. So, I mean, it works both ways. You know, um, another type of uh, work we do, for example, is something called a historic building recording, where someone will go to, it might be, it might be a country house, it might be a farmhouse, you know, it could be anything really, like a, build, a building of some sort of historic value. Okay. And they'll go around and they'll, they'll photograph potentially thousands of photographs of this building. And then they'll, they'll research the history, they'll look at the census records, they'll look at, you know, deeds of sale, that sort of thing, you know. And then they just basically do almost like a one-place study on this building, really, or, or okay. an estate or a farm, whatever it is. And that's, I think, as you say, you know, that's, um, that's an opportunity where family history would be really useful to sort of inform on the archaeology as well. It can be sort of part and parcel of, you know, your day-to-day -day job, but then you don't think about the potential to add a little bit more. So yeah, so they're, but they're, they're, it's a really, but again, it's a really useful way for archaeology to see the value of family history and vice versa as well. Yeah. Now you were just talking about Victorian records, mm. and archaeologists obviously dig much older things than that. So do you get much of a chance to explore records from earlier, pre-Victorian? Yes, absolutely, we do. Particularly for say the medieval period, for example. So a lot of the old manor houses, particularly ones where larger country estates been built say in the 18th century you know where they've they've, they've built this grander style but often there's a um, an older house there originally which has been knocked down or you know stole you know robbed out for stone okay. um so if we're doing work on that area then we'll be looking for old maps potentially you know really really old ones <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of endless, the amount of possibilities there are, really. But, yeah, we look at, we look at all sorts. Absolutely. Okay. Any, any sort of documentary evidence helps to inform what... Because, ultimately, we don't want to dig. That's, you know, our, if we can leave it in ground, we will. Archaeology is destructive at the end of the day. We can only do it once. That's true, yeah. So if, if we can find as much as we can out before we start, you know, hoofing out with a shovel, then, um, then we will. So we will look at, you know, absolutely everything we can in advance. So I've had my X and Y chromosomes traced back and it tells me that my mitochondrial ancestor my maternal 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 etc line mm. was living somewhere to the east of the mediterranean about seventeen thousand years ago now i'm finding that very hard to imagine that person from seventeen thousand years ago and it's hard to find a sense of connection to them yeah so do you think that maybe DNA for family history research and archaeology might come a bit closer to connect us to kind of nearer history? And by that, I mean kind of Romans, Saxons, Celts, Picts, Tudors, Vikings, that kind of thing, which are perhaps a little easier to imagine because we have some archaeological artifacts from those eras. I mean, it's a good point. And I, I, I agree with you. I, I've, I've done my DNA and I, I find it difficult to relate to these people as well because obviously it's so, far, so long ago and they don't live anywhere that we recognise. So it's hard yes, to even yeah. picture what they may have been. Exactly. Um, I mean, what we do know from um, is that, you know, as far, as far as we're aware, sort of early 
you know, early man, as it were, sort of originates in southern to eastern Africa, you know, a few million years ago, basically. And then, yeah, they, they migrate out. Yes. Yeah. What we do have, there's an example of a, I'm trying to think how old he is. I can't remember. It's Ertzi the Iceman. I don't know if you know of... I recognise that name. Yeah, he's basically, he was, I think he was killed. I think he was hit with an arrow. He was basically murdered, really, a few thousand years ago, sort okay. of in, I think, the southern Alps. And he was encased in ice, more or less, you know, pretty quick, to the point where, like, the meal is still in his stomach. Wow, um, okay. And he's got tattoos that are visible on his arm. And he, he was discovered... I think about 25, 30 years ago, maybe a bit more. And I think they, they did like a DNA test in that area and then tested it against his DNA. And they found out that there were some actual people that like that he had living descendants who were living in that area. I'm not sure how strong the science is on that one, but I, I like to think, you know, that they'll have done their job. I mean, this is, you know, it's uh, it wasn't just sort of a, something they did for fun. So um, in, in that sense, those people will be able to feel a connection to someone who lived thousands of years ago, which is just unheard of for everyone else. And they could, they know what he looked like, they know what tattoos he had, you know, they knew sort of what his disabilities were. He was, I think he had some worms in his stomach at the time of his death, so okay. probably you know, not feeling very well. Um, and he was being hunted, you know, in, in the Southern Alps. So to have, I mean, to have that sort of connection with anyone, really, to understand like their last moments in finite detail, their last meal is is unusual for people in the Victorian period, let alone someone who died thousands of years ago. So, you know, I think the potential's particularly when people are coming out of the permafrost, is, is there. But, um, you know, <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, things are advancing all the time. So who, who knows what we'll be able to find next? Yeah. I mean, what we do a lot of work on like osteology work, so a lot of work on bones to try and work out arthritis, diseases, that sort of thing. So, I mean, obviously there's the Richard III stuff as well. So, I mean, that's that's quite a good exercise in uh, establishing a link between someone from four, five, 500 years ago and um, people living today. Yep. What's your favourite part of researching? Um, confirming a hunch, maybe. Ah, oh, it's a good one. Um, yeah, I think I think breaking a brick wall has got to be one of my favourites. You know, something that's been holding you up for a while, and then you finally find you finally find that thing, and then you think, ah, I knew it, I knew it all along. You know, you just needed. <laughs> In my heart of hearts, I knew that that was true. Or sometimes it's the opposite, you know, and it sends you in another direction, and then you think, fair enough, you know, can't can't always be right. But um, yeah, for me, I think I think it's. Get no, like you know, it's going one step further. It's it's finding out, or at least that used to be the case. Actually, recently, I've um, I've been talking to a lot of my cousins that I've you know that I, that I know from when I was young, and other ones that I've met through DNA and ancestry and all the rest of it. Yeah. And just I've really, really been enjoying sharing photos and letters. So actually, for me, for more recently, genuinely, the last sort of few months or so, um, I've really, really enjoyed finding the things that I would never ever be able to find no matter how hard I looked online or, you know, stuff that's just living in people's boxes. And, um, you know, I found some really special stories in the last few months just doing that. And that's been very satisfying as well. Did you have many relatives around you to, to kind of a more immediate relatives to, to help you at all with that? Yes, I did. I had my nan. So she, when I was young, I used to go over to my nan sort of every Sunday. And she, she would often tell me about, you know, what, what her, her dad did or her parents or her ancestors or, you know, my grandfather's ancestors as well. He, he passed away by then. So I wish I'd listened more, basically, because she told me so, so much. And I remember her telling me this, but I can very little of it I can pin down in my in my mind and be, I'd be like, oh, what, what regiment did he she say that this person belonged to? Or, you know, what was what, what I wish I'd gone through all the pictures with her and said, who's this person? Who's this person? Because I've I've I recently inherited all these pictures. I've got them all and I just don't know who that, some of them are, to be honest. With you. I mean, I've, I've worked out a few and I've got, a few, as you say, I've got a few a few cousins who who think they might be able to help. But ultimately, if they don't know either, then. That's that, really. You like to think that no matter, like, you persevere and you'll be able to work it out, but it's not always possible. Well, my advice on on that would be to hold on to those photographs and look at for the sites that have this. Look at the hints on images, and then see if you can match up any likenesses to try and work it out. So, uh, hopefully, again, my fingers are crossed for you on this one. But hopefully, you can name a few of those people in those pictures. I'm optimistic. I am. Is there kind of one tangible thing from your own family's history that you could dig up from the soil? What would you wish that to be? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, like a personal possession or something? Yeah, I do know the answer, actually. I, I've been transcribing a will from, I think, 1760 for an ancestor of mine called Anthony South. He owned a lot okay. of land sort of on the... He's my only ancestor to own a lot of land, actually. So, you know, most of the others don't. But he, he owned quite a bit, okay. nearly a thousand acres on the northwest side of Ely. And he talks about some 
like tankards and some basically some you know family silver and it's got it, it, he talks about you know that's got the family crest on it and i have no idea what that family crest is and i don't know anything about that artifact other than what he's described but i would love to pick it up and see the crest okay and then you know potentially be able to take that on and do some more research with that and um, so I, I think i think something like that potentially for me would be what i'd enjoy to see well that would be a great find to to discover that so uh, i wonder where that went so <laughs> It's probably in someone's box somewhere, you know, it's just a long time ago. So, so you never know, maybe I'll, I'll reach out to the right person eventually. One day, my fingers are crossed for you. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> so what does family history mean to you? I think it's it's a, it's a connection. It's, um, I mean, for archaeology, you know, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, really. But for me, archaeology sort of, and it's the same family history, is um, it's trying to give voices back to people who can't speak anymore. You know, it, the people, it's so easy to just drift into, you know, the passage of time and yeah. people to lose track of you. So I, I, I just love finding out people's stories. And then I, I, I'm trying I'm trying to write them all down in a way that I can pass on potentially at some time. But I'm in way over my head, to be honest with you. It's such a massive task. I hadn't realised this until I started. But uh, as soon as I started, I realised quite how much I didn't know, which is actually really useful, but also quite scary. <laughs> Our family trees can be home to all sorts of characters, some good, some bad, and some just just hard to understand. With this in mind, it's now time for my guests to pick one of their relatives that they've researched and to tell their life story. So, James, who are you going to introduce us to? I'm going to introduce you to one of my wife's ancestors, a man named Darcy Fowler. Okay. Got himself into quite a pickle and it all just sort of got worse, so... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sounds like an interesting person. Very much so. Yes, absolutely. Quite quite the... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to be him, I don't think. So where does Darcy's story begin? So Darcy was baptised on the 12th of November, 1738, in Stockton-on-Tees in County Durham. Okay. He was either the youngest or the second youngest of 10 children to Captain William Fowler and Mary Launce. Yeah. The family was pretty prominent. They were involved in sort of the maritime trade, uh, as were a lot of prominent families in Stockton at that time. Okay. He would have lived pretty comfortably. They were a prominent family, so I imagine they would have been servants as well. In 1755, aged probably about 16, 17, he was apprenticed to a Francis Lowson of Darlington. Right, okay. Which must have been a bit of a... Um, a bit of a maybe a bit of a shock to a 16 17 year old to leave home and go. I mean Darlington's not too far away from Stockton but it must have been it must have been a bit of a, a shock to the system for Darcy and who knows whether he wanted this you know being apprenticed at such a young age is, is always a choice from your parents isn't it at that time so yeah. I, I like to think that you know he, he had his two pence <laughs> but you never know but I mean one of the interesting things about being an apprentice at that time is that you're completely reliant upon your master, for example, for food, clothing, lodging. You're at their liberty, basically. And they're not, until at this time, they're not legally obliged to actually provide you with any of those things. Not until I think about 1802 when they pass a law that says, actually, no, you need to treat them well. The chances are that they probably would have done, but, yeah. um, but they weren't required to by law. It could have been an uncomfortable time. That sounds like a really bad oversight mm. to to kind of be completely in the charge of someone and there being no obligation whatsoever for them to look after you. Yeah, that's it. It's, um, you know, it's a gamble, isn't it? Yeah. Like you want, you want to hope that your parents know the person and have put you as someone that, you know, that they'll be able to see and they'll, that they'll report back. I think given how far away he was, which wasn't that far, that, you know, I, I like to think that he, he was probably, he was all right, I think. <laughs> I don't know that. I can't prove it. But I, I, I think he was all right. I think the average amount of time for an apprenticeship is seven years. But it seems that Darcy may have only done actually five for some reason. I'm not sure why. But he later recalls that he was admitted to the court of the King's Bench in Westminster in 1760. So only five years after he's actually started his apprenticeship. Okay. He's definitely living in London in 1761. There's a poll book record from Stockton which shows his abode as London, and he's renting his house out to somebody else back in Stockton. Right. At quite a young age, he's sort of had a bit of a rough time, and he's got lots of siblings, but he's, um, both his parents have died by 1760, so by the time he's about 21, 22, that sort of age. Okay. And he, I think potentially because of the profession he was going into, he's actually named on his, his mother's administration bond at the age of 22. So, 
you know, is essentially tied up in the process of dealing with probate at such a young age, which is not something I'd want to do. Wow. No. <laughs> But he's definitely back in Stockton by 1762. He's taking on an apprentice himself, and then he takes on another one the following year. So he's he, he's he's establishing himself. You know, he's um, he's getting his practice up and running. Yeah. On the eighth of April, 1765, he is married by license to a Jane Calvert in Ainderby Steeple, North Yorkshire. And interestingly, he signs his name as D like D apostrophe R C. So I, I think it's an attempt to sort of make himself a bit more seem a bit more upper class somehow i'm not sure because previously on his baptism record it's definitely darcy no apostrophe so d-a-r-c-e-y or no e no e no it's d-a-r-c-y and then he signs his own name as d apostrophe a-r-c-y okay yeah there's an article in the newcastle chronicle about five days later i'll read it to you because it's a little bit interesting on monday mr darcy fowler an eminent attorney in stockton was married in North Allerton, which is basically it's next to Ainderby Steeple, so it's uh, it's more recognisable, I think, to Miss Calvert, a very agreeable, genteel, and well accomplished young lady with a fortune of thousand pounds. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the newly married couple, on their arrival at Stockton that evening, were saluted with peals of bells, firing of guns, and other demonstrations of joy. Well, I mean, that just sounds like me on a night out, to be honest. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. That's it. You know, <laughs> yeah, firing of guns. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> breaking into the churches, getting getting the uh, peal of the bells, of bells yeah, going. Great. That's it. <laughs> sounds like uh, he's off to quite a good start with this marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's you know he's he's doing well. He's um he's in a good position in society, particularly within Stockton on Tees. He goes on to have three children, okay, two daughters and a son, also called Darcy. And it's interesting, as you say, that he's got people firing guns for him. He's got people ringing the church bells for him when he comes back. You know, not anyone can have that. Exactly. So um, I think I think one of the reasons that he's able to do this is his position in society. Yeah. And he's a very very active Freemason, as were obviously a lot of people sort of in the upper echelons of uh, society at that time. In 1769, he holds the position of senior warden within the lodge at the Queen's Head pub in Stockton. Okay. I don't know how much you know about Freemasonry, but senior warden is sort of the second highest within a lodge. So he must have been doing it for some years to be able to, to get to that point. Interestingly, the junior warden, which is the third highest, the one below him, is a guy called John Stapleton Raisbeck. And he is the mayor of Stockton on Tees in 1769 and 1770. So, you know, he's... He's above the mayor. Yeah, that's it. Well, in that sense, he is. I'm not sure otherwise, but he's certainly... They're they're swimming in the same circles. Despite that, despite his, you know, what seems to be a really good start to life, he's he's got three children, he's got money, you know, he's got a practice. He appears to be unhappy. And he decides that his life will be better if he moves to America. Okay. Which seems like quite a big decision, but it's one that he's taken. It's, it's hard to know precisely what his motivation might be, but he might be wishing to take advantage of a situation in the North Carolina, which had been sort of proving very lucrative for those of his profession in the preceding decades. So in the um, 1750s and 60s, the sort of well-established landowners in inland North Carolina suffered a series of droughts and crop failures, which led to many falling into debt with recent mercantile immigrants in the area. As a result of these debts, many of the landowners were taken to court, and such was the number of legal cases being brought to the courts that it actually increased 16-fold between 1755 and 1765. So there's a lot of work to be had over there. And presumably, you know, this is while Darcy is sort of looking at, this is while he's training, it's while he's early in his profession. So he'll be, I'd have thought he'll be aware of these developments, you know, across the pond, as it were. Yes, yeah. But the lawyers who were conducting these cases were seen to be using the situation for their own benefit. And, you know, they were taking liberties, basically, you know, stuff that they shouldn't be. And whether they were or not, that's what they were seen to be doing, I don't know. But And they became a target for a group who wished to end this perceived corruption, who were called the Regulators. The Regulators, this, this sort of formed into like a semi, almost a war, but certainly like a large sort of social unrest. Starting in 1766, the War of Regulation ends in defeat for the Regulators in the middle of 1771. Um, so the lawyers can carry on going, you know doing whatever it is that they do and making money. I think Darcy must have been aware of this. The war regulation ends roughly sort of the middle of, middle of 1771. And it seems that Darcy arrives in America around about that time. So potentially it was on its way down and he was thought, yeah, I'll, I'll come now. But he appears to have arrived in New York initially, where he's sort of subscribing to legal books, legal commentaries, 
and he's part of a committee that's distributing about 30,000 acres of land to various people within the province of New York. He's definitely in North Carolina by 1772. Okay. He is mentioned as the attorney involved in the sale of a plantation called Hunt Hill, which is actually in South Carolina, but he's specifically mentioned as being of Wil- Wilmington in North Carolina. That plantation included 4,000 acres and 150 slaves. So he's clearly not above that, unfortunately. Although initially working from Wilmington, he's later listed as a practicing attorney in Wake County, which is sort of further to the west inland. And one of the other people who's listed there as well is a guy called John Penn, who is later a signatory of the Declaration of Independence. Okay. So he seems to be, again, he's sort of establishing himself again. He's been given permission by the governor, a guy called Josiah Martin, to practice. And I think he's starting to move along in good circles. He later recalls that, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he later recalls that it, business was good, basically. He's doing all right for himself, better than he was back in back in England. Okay. As far as I can tell, he continues his work day to day until the outbreak of the American War of Independence in 1775, which is obviously the last thing you want because war's not good for business for most time. Some of the listeners might correct me, but as far as I'm aware, things were reasonably quiet in North Carolina and like in the first year of the war in 1775. It was mostly a bit further north than that. But on the 3rd of January, 1776, the governor of North Carolina, Josiah Martin, learns of a British army numbering some 2,000 soldiers, which had departed Ireland under General Sir Henry Clinton and was due to arrive in the area by sort of mid-February. Right, Okay. So he decides, brilliant, um, we've got a British army coming, you know, we'll do our bit. I'm going to raise some, I'm going to raise some soldiers, basically. So he dispatches recruitment officers. And by the 18th of February, three and a half thousand men had assembled at a place called Cross Creek. It's worth noting that absolutely none of these men okay. were regular British Army troops. They were all sort of volunteers from North Carolina. They were largely consisting of former regulators, so people that Darcy probably wouldn't get on with, as, as well as Highland Scots immigrants, many of, many of whom had fought against the Britain in the previous Jacobite Rebellion. Oh, OK. So, yeah, quite a... Um, Unusual group. A mixture. Of, yeah, quite a mixture, definitely. People who generally I wouldn't have thought got get on with each other. But they're all there, and for some reason they've, they've answered the call. On the 18th of February, they leave Cross Creek, intending to head to the coast to link up with this incoming army. Unfortunately, what Josiah Martin's not heard is that the army's been massively delayed, and I don't think it's even set sail by this point, or it's only just set sail. So it's not, it's not coming when he thinks it's coming, basically. So it's doomed from the start, really. Oh. Uh, you can see where this is going. But even though they don't know that, obviously there's three and a half thousand men to start with. Numbers dwindle quickly. People are deserting quite regularly. They're, I think that they're being shadowed by the patriots at this, on, the, on the way to the coast as well. And I think they're being sort of, you know, harried a little bit, really. So people are leaving. They're, they're, they're not interested. Right. Okay. By the morning of the 27th of February, when the lawyers have reached a place called Moore's Creek Bridge, there were no more than 800 people left, including Darcy. So and mo- most of those who were left were Highlanders armed with broadswords. Okay. I mean, that's quite a depletion from 3,000. It's a rapid one, actually, as well. Really quite surprisingly rapid, given that they don't know that this army's not coming. Like, there, there must be some serious problems in and amongst that group. Probably they don't get on with each other and they're, they're arguing and it's just not worth it for them. And there's plenty of them with rather large swords, which is a, a tricky situation to be in. Yeah, not again, not one I'd want to see myself in. On that morning, the Patriots engaged what's left of the Loyalist force, basically, at this bridge, which they'd largely dismantled overnight to the point where it's like a really narrow like plank of wood, basically, going mm-hmm. across. The Loyalists attack anyway trying to charge across this bridge with broadswords. And as you can imagine, it's just, it's a route, basically. It goes terribly. Uh, There's 50 dead and wounded for the Loyalists compared to about two or three for the Patriots. So it's... uh, Right, okay. It's it's terrible. It's, It's gone really badly. It couldn't have gone any worse. Darcy was captured in the aftermath of this skirmish, and he was initially imprisoned in Halifax, which isn't too far away. I think that's in North Carolina. And he was released on parole a little over three months later on the 3rd of May, 1776. So he's been imprisoned for about three months. I can't imagine it's pleasant. He later claims that his parole lasted for over three years, but this isn't true. Fortunately, documents don't lie. He was actually discharged from his parole after less than two years, and that was after he'd taken and signed the North Carolina Oath of Allegiance and Abjuration, which renounces allegiance to the king and to Great Britain, basically declares them to be, he's not beholden to them. So he's, he's, he's signed this, whether he's done it under duress or not, I don't know, but he's signed it um, and he's been released from his parole. Despite this, he couldn't work 
you know, he had no way of sustaining himself. Um, obviously, the local population don't like him because anyone who's left is people who are sympathetic to like the Patriots. Yep. In his own words, he was almost killed by the rebellious inhabitants. So presumably he's been attacked, you know, um, a common sort of way of shaming or attacking people who were loyalists was tarring and feathering. He doesn't actually mention that, but, you know, it's potential that that may have, that, that may have happened to him. Mm-hmm. And he survives off basically charity from people who are sympathetic to him in the community. Did his wife and children actually make it over to the US? It's unclear, actually, if his family ever came over with him in 1771. Presumably they must have done. It's unlikely to leave your family behind for, for quite that sort of period of time. They're definitely back in England by early to mid-1780. So after he's finished his parole, basically, but things aren't good. So I suspect if they are there, he probably realises that he can't support them and he's sending them, he's sending them back to Britain, basically. Unfortunately, both his wife and his son both die in the middle of 1780 and they're buried in his, his native stockton upon Tees. So, um, mm. you know, it, it's... Um, it's going from bad to worse. It's not good. Things sort of continue this way. He's he's hanging out in the area. He's probably not doing very well for himself. And then in 1781, a British army led by Lord Cornwallis arrives in North Carolina and he has some sort of moderate success. And basically Darcy takes this opportunity and he thinks, yeah, I'm out. And he leaves where he is, which I think is Duplin County. And he joins up with them at Wilmington. So he's, he's returned to the to the Loyalist standard, essentially. He stays in Wilmington for most of 1781. It's unclear what sort of role he's taking on with the army, whether he's actually fighting or whether he's just sort of, you know, he's just there. He's a bit of a refugee sort of thing. Um, He doesn't talk about fighting later on at this point in time, so I suspect he's not. But he's definitely there, and he's eventually evacuated from Wilmington in November 1781, which is when the British lose Wilmington. Okay. And he's taken from there to Charleston in South Carolina, which is already under siege when he arrives. Um, he's under siege for quite some time. Um, he stays there for a little over a year before that city falls as well. And he's evacuated again in December 1782. Yep. From there, he goes to Jamaica. Right. Okay. Uh, arriving prob- probably in December 1782, January 1783. I'm not quite sure how long it takes really to get from South Carolina to Jamaica at that time. But it'd be around about that sort of time, I'd have thought. And he actually tries to make a go of it in Jamaica. He tries to establish himself, but he's, he's lost... But obviously, books are expensive in this, in this point of time. He's lost all his legal books. He's got nothing, basically. Right, OK. And he can't do it. He, he's unable to do it. It's, it's not just that. Basically, Jamaica's also going through a massive recession at this time because they've just... All of their trade from the colonies is basically cut off in the immediate aftermath of the war. So there's just, there's just no... There's no work there, and he has no money anyway. So um, he manages to get back to Britain by about sort of the middle of 1784. And he makes an application to the Commission for Losses and Services of American Loyalists, which is where a lot of this information comes from. Um, He's writing these applications himself. So we can see his handwriting. He's talking about his service. He's embellishing and he's hiding bits. So he's not, he's saying that he was paroled for three years. It's not true, but he's not going to admit to that. He's not talking about the fact that he signed the uh, you know oath of abjuration and uh, but he's not talking about the fact that he's renounced the king. He's left that out conveniently. It's a little bit of an inconvenient detail. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I'd leave it out as well, I think, to be honest with you. I don't think his application would be well, well no. reviewed if uh, <laughs> he was completely honest. But basically, he's, he's again, he's, he's not working. If his former friends are still around, like, they're not helping him. He's living in London, you know, and he's not in work. He does have supporting letters for his application from Josiah Martin, the former governor of North Carolina, and from a guy called Colonel Donald MacDonald. So he is he was the guy who led the Loyalists at the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge. Okay. So he's saying, yep, he was here, you know, he did his duty, that sort of thing. So he's got he's got pretty good people backing him up, basically. So his application's a strong one. And he's a lawyer, so he'll know what to write. But he's yeah, he's claiming for loss of income, he's claiming for loss of his books, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, not massive claims, actually, really, in comparison to what a lot of the other people, like, you know, land and houses. He's not talking about houses. So he may not have owned property, actually, uh, while he was there, which is a bit surprising. I guess if his claim was uh, slightly lower, then maybe it's more likely to go through and then he gets what he needs. It's possible. It, he actually makes his claim after the commission is finished. So he's sort of saying, I'm a bit late. Can I can I do it anyway? So I think maybe yeah. you're right. Yeah, he's, um, he knows that he's past the deadline, but he's just he's going to try and get something back. He's yeah. definitely back in work by 1786. He's listed as part of a prosecution team in London. And then he's, he drops off the radar, actually, for eight years until the 17th of April, 1794, when 
aged about 51, 52, he marries, again, a woman called Anne Curry, who is also a widow, same as himself. And does his name change yet again? Has he got a different piece of punctuation? No, he's, he's, um, he's actually, once, he, once he's changed his name, he's reasonably okay. consistent, to be fair to him. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when other people are writing his name, they, they spell it very differently. So there's a lot of variation. But fortunately, he's got a very distinct first name. So he's, this is one of the reasons why I like him initially, because he was easy enough to pick up in, in the records, really, because he's probably the only person alive called Darcy Fowler, really, at that time. He seems to be pretty quiet after that. He, there is a record... A burial record from 1800 and it's one of those where it's spelt a bit funny so I think the person who's writing his entry doesn't know how to spell his name possibly could be that his you know his wife's already dead or you know and, and someone knows him and saying oh yeah that's Darcy Fowler and he's thinking well I'll just I'll write this but interestingly he's buried at Lockfield's nonconformist ground in Walworth London which is odd because all of his other religious activity including his marriage six years previously is through the Church of England so potentially he may have gone through some sort of uh, late life crisis. And then, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's Darcy's story, really. I think he just sort of gets caught up with things. He backs the wrong horse reasonably consistently and then comes back home. So it's kind of a riches to war to slightly rags and then back to kind of a normality. Yeah, that's it, to a point at least, yeah. Possibly not the normality he'd been used to previously, but... To a point where he, he can live, at least. Well, thank you for digging the dirt on De R.C. Fowler. But I think it's now time for you to face... The Brick Wall. Brick walls. Please, no more brick walls. Nah, I'm only kidding. They're kind of fun. Well, for a few hours, maybe weeks... Less so for years and decades and beyond. So therefore, it's now time for you, dear listeners, to see if you can help my guest make a breakthrough. So, James, how can we help? Well, my brick wall is my great grandfather, a man named George Richard Cordwell. That's spelled C-O-R-D-W-E-L-L. Um, that's important, I think, because there's lots of other ways to spell Cordwell. OK. I know quite a lot about him, actually. My nan who I mentioned earlier in the episode, she talked about him quite a lot. But my brick wall in regards to him is quite specific, and it's down to his service during World War I. Sure. I've been doing a lot of research as to my World War I ancestors, all of which have sort of come up with some incredible stories, except for George, huh. who I know very, very little about, to be honest with you, in terms of his service. To sort of start things off, he was born on the 30th of August, 1894, in Hampstead in London. His parents were Joseph Cordwell and Phoebe Elsden, uh, later Cordwell. He shows up on the 1911 census in Kent, in Strood, and then three years later he marries his wife, okay. Winifred Edith Pryor, on the 17th of March 1914 in Mepham, in Kent. His first daughter, Barbara Lucy Cordwell, is born at the end of 1914, and he has a son, Joseph George Richard Cordwell, born in October 1916, so sort of middle of the way through the war. He has lots of other children after the war, but he definitely has these two before and during. Okay. I know that he was in the military. There's a photo of him and Barbara and George and his wife Edith taken shortly after Joseph was born, probably at a thought very late 1916, maybe very early 1917. Right, okay. Um, and he's wearing his military uniform. He's, he's incredibly tall. I think my nan said he was about six foot five, six foot six. So he's towering over these people. <laughs> he's sporting quite a cracking moustache, and he's looking, he's looking, he's looking good in his military uniform. So he's okay. He, you know, he's he definitely serves. We used to have his First World War medals when I was young. I remember playing with them and putting them on my chest, and my nan being like, "No, no, you can't. They're really important." And they, I think, they went off to a cousin at some point, but I'm not sure which one. And my nan told me that when he was in the war, he was subject to mustard gas quite a lot, and it affected his breathing later on in life. As far as she was aware, and as far as everyone else is aware, like he, he, there's a picture of him in uniform. Yeah, you know, he he clearly told her stories about the war. So you know, he had to say he was subject to mustard gas, which can't have been pleasant. But I can't find any record of his service at all. Obviously, I know the service records generally burnt, which is a massive shame and has been a heartbreak for me these last few weeks while I've been researching. I can't find his medal index card. If he was discharged because of his mustard gas, the effects of it, he should have a silver war badge, which I can't find a record of either. Okay. But he definitely served. There are the medals as well. And yeah, I don't know. There is a George Cordwell with his name, 
but he's a little bit younger and he's about a foot shorter as well so you, it's not it's not something you'd make a mistake with difficult to hide that an extra foot in height isn't yeah. it yeah unless they forced him to sit down or crouch then i doubt yeah. it's him very much i mean age quite a lot of people lied some of them said that they were older than they really were so that they could go and fight mm. but height is not yeah. really that easy to hide no no he definitely wouldn't have been able to hide that definitely not and there are some other parts of that service record that don't match up either okay Another way to spell Cordwell is C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. That's sort of the more common spelling. Um, but even looking with that, I can't find anything that is obviously him. There are some George, it's quite a lot actually, George Cordwell spelt that way. But none of them have information that I can tie to him. Okay. I can't remember. My nan did tell me what regiment he was in, but I was young and I don't remember it. I wish so, so much that I paid more attention when I was younger, as I think a lot of people do. Because, I mean, you get to that point where... Um, I mean, very. I mean, my nanny passed away a year ago, and it was sort of around that time where I sort of tried to gather all this information. But she was very, very deaf and couldn't really see very well, and it, it, it was impossible to get that information from her at that point. Uh, so, a huge regret of mine that I didn't do that a long time ago. He has another child on the fourteenth of April, nineteen twenty-one, and then my nan and her twin sister were born on the seventeenth of September, nineteen twenty-five. And there's another child, Helen, thereafter. He basically, after the war, he sort of works uh, in the railways. So my nan always described them moving around a lot, and particularly around Kent and Sussex, that sort of area, the, the southeast, really. Okay. During the Second World War, he was awarded a British Empire Medal in 1942 for his work in keeping the railways open at that time, along with okay. lots of other people. He wasn't the only one. And he lived until 1969 where he died in Alverston in Lancashire, basically. But yeah, it's specifically the, the World War One part that I, I want to try and find more out about because those stories are often so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I, I always feel very connected. I, although I've never been to war, I feel very, I don't know, uh, overwhelmed really by what they went through and their, their service and their sacrifice, particularly hearing the other stories that I've heard from my other ancestors, you know, where they were wounded and I had one who was killed in, in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. So it's... Um, you know, I'd like to be able to add his story, really, to, you know, give back that voice, you know, as I was talking earlier, like that, that part of his story is missing, really. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know where to go with it. So <laughs> I'm hoping that's where people can help me. It's interesting that you haven't seen the kind of signing up papers and you can't find the medal card mm. and also any kind of discharge papers as well. Yep. Because I know that when I look for my ancestors or relatives who have served in the First World War, I do find... Maybe not all of them, but mm. I do find several of them. So I think I'm quite lucky from that respect. It's just odd that you don't find any of them, but then you've got the medals. So That's it. Medals, the photograph. Like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe the pho photograph may be a side, but, mm. the, but the medals would be hard to say that you were there and you weren't. So it, he was clearly there because he's got the medals. Yeah, that's it. I'm wondering whether it's just the variations of the name that, that, that that's hiding him, because if he's Cordwell and you've already said Caldwell with an A, maybe he might have been Coldwell or maybe a cool with a kind of a spelling like a cauldron, like a C-A-U-L yeah. or a Cornwell. or I mean, the combinations are probably quite... There's quite a lot of them. This is it. I mean, because his first name is George yeah. as well. It's yeah. um, I, If it had been something distinctive, it would be easier. But there are so many Georges. This is where you needed Darcy, you see. I know. This is it. Why couldn't it be Darcy Cordwell? That would have been so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> have you tried looking in any kind of newspaper reports? Sometimes they would refer to people who have gone away or maybe if they've been wounded or if they've come home even. Sometimes they would name them. I have, yes. I've looked. I've looked on like the British newspaper archive, for example. Sure. Interestingly, at the bottom of a box of family history stuff that I have, there is a newspaper mm -hmm. from 1917, and there is a private Caldwell who is sort of mentioned there. Okay. But it's a box from. It's the wrong side of the family's box. Oh. So, um, sort of part of me is just like, well, maybe it could be. But on the other side, it's like, why would they have this newspaper buried at the bottom of their box and not, not my nan? I think it might be a coincidence. but Could be a coincidence, but maybe there's something else on that newspaper that that's the reason they kept it. Could be, yeah. It might be. That's it. I need, I, I've looked through it and I can't see anything else that's obvious. I mean, there is a lot of description of um, the Battle of Menin Road Ridge, but... I'd have thought lots of newspapers would have talked about lots of battles. So some, for someone, that battle is potentially significant, but I'm just not sure who okay. it could be. If I had a service record, I might be able to time to that. Or even if I just knew what time it is, I'd be able to look and see 
or what regiment I'd be able to look and see, look at the war diaries, for example, and see where he might have been. Yeah. Try, trying to work out is just so difficult, really. It's <laughs> I don't know how to narrow him down. Do you think that maybe there's like a kind of a, a date and a place that you kind of lose track of him? So where is your actual brick wall, you know, the last known record for him? Or, may, or maybe the, the, the first appearance of him after the war? Mm. It's it's the first appearance of him after the war. Uh, yeah, I'd say 14th of April, 1921, when he's, uh, he's, he's in Mepham when his daughter's being born. Or failing that, if uh, if some reason he is away, then at my grandmother's um, birth. But I think, I think immediately after is probably the best time. So 14th of April, 1921, I think. What's the best way for people to contact you if they think that they have a clue or a research idea? I think the best way is through my Twitter, well, X profile, which is at jdanter. That's uh, J-D-A-N-T-E-R. You'll recognise me as a picture of me holding a big piece of pottery. So it's hard to go wrong. <laughs> unmistakable archaeologist i think so yeah of course listeners can head over to familyhistoriespodcast.com where they can read this episode's show notes or send us an email on hello at familyhistoriespodcast.com and we'll pass it along to james now whilst we wait for listeners to hunt down some answers it's possible that i might and i say might just be able to help you with this but you're going to need to follow me through to the garage Lead on here we are wow what what is all this lot well it's my secret time machine really yeah really really it's a fully operational highly calibrated scientific manipulator of physics and stuff you know that this this could revolutionize my work yeah i guess it could but for now i'm offering you a return ticket to somewhere and somewhere let's say the coldwell household you can solve your brick wall for yourself Well, if this really is what you say it is, then okay. Perfect. Well, if you just take a seat over there. Yep, mind that cable. Uh, Okay, right. Uh, I'll set the coordinates. Uh, Remind me again of the date and place. It's um, the 14th of April, 1921 in Mepham, Kent. Me, Kent. There we go. Can I take my trowel? Uh, Well, okay, but don't go rummaging too much. You might change the history of archaeology itself. Fair point. I'll be really careful. Excellent. Okay, well, you need this. It's your return ticket. Just press the big button on the top when you're ready to come home. Got you. Okay, here we go. James Danter. Thank you, goodbye, and good luck. 1921, yep. Horamabad, Iran? Oh, he's got his trowel. He'll be all right. Well, there we go. Done. Nothing untoward going to happen? Anything? No? Nothing? Hmm. Okay, well. I better just go and switch. Ah! Ow! That cable, that... (gasps) 